I'm really worried that I don't see them. Wow. Where are they? <laughs> Uh-oh. You probably can't call them, right? Like they No, can... usually they come running when they hear us. We're on the lookout for the pigs. Ike and his brother Dave are third-generation farmers who left farming behind to pursue, let's say, greener pastures, only to return to their grandparents' farm seven years ago after realizing that they wanted to carry on their family's legacy by implementing a regenerative farming model on their 200-acre family farm by rotating pastured raised cows, pigs, and chickens. We took some time on the weekend to tour their farm, discuss their business model, and the challenges and benefits of running a small-scale regenerative farm. We're here at Red House Ranch, right? Yes. Was it always known as Red House Ranch? No, it was a dairy farm, a beef farm, a row crop farm back when my dad ran the farm, and it did not have a name back then. Really? Yeah. So it was just a farm? A farm. It was the classic agricultural model at the time. Every hillside around here had a farm like this, up to 500 acres, 100 dairy cows, a few pigs, and that slowly disappeared over time as dairy farms aggregated into much, much larger operations. And as you drive around rural upstate New York, you'll see all of the artifacts of all of these old farms. The, ar the biggest artifact from this farm was a barn that stood here. There was mm -hmm. a massive barn, and in the early 80s, there was a line wind. It's essentially an instant tornado, and it blew it away. What? It is completely gone. It's buried out there in the field. <laughs> and actually that was a blessing for us because having these old ancient buildings is, yeah. a, is a massive economic burden. Yeah. So with that being gone, um, my father had stopped farming by then. And what he did is, I'll show you the machine he used up here, oh, is, he, is he mowed. Um, and we all thought, Oh, what a waste of time and diesel fuel. Why is he how out many, doing how that? How many acres was he mowing? He was mowing about 250 acres. Wow. But if he hadn't mowed, it would look like that. Yeah, And we wouldn't be standing here right now because it would all be this scrubby forest that's yeah. absolutely unusable. Um, you know, it was a da when we were little kids, it was a dairy barn. We would, he would milk cows, did all that kind of classic stuff, everything that every, every other farmer did. And, and was this also for your, yourself, or was it also for, you know, selling to Oh, no, it was selling. Stores? There was there used to be a railroad pickup at the bottom of the hill. And the more inter even more interesting than that is this farm was started by my grandparents, and they raised chickens here, they, uh -huh. and, and they had cows, but they raised eggs that went to New York City because there was a demand in New York City. And it's kind of ironic that one of the things that we started to do, but we are stopping now, is we produced eggs that went to Boston. Wow. So um, this is called a brush hog. And this is what my dad used, and we use now for, the, you know, since the 80s, to keep the pastures as pastures instead of uh, forest. And what are you pasturing now? So we've been doing the classic in the, what's the field? The Joel Salatin model of pastured pork and grass-fed, grass-finished beef. And we do have chickens, pastured chickens on the ground as well. And so that's um, a kind of a rotational model. It's funny, regenerative agriculture has become such a mainstream term now. But yeah, it is, a lot of people call it farming the microbes. Um, we use a model that r simulates the coming and going of the buffalo moving north to south or the wildebeest in Africa going across the plains, right? They're there for a very short amount of time and they don't come back for a year, which gives the soil a, an incredible amount of time to, to regenerate and regrow. And that's what we do with our cows. We use some interesting, it's called polywire. You can see it there on the side of the building. Mm -hmm. um, we move our cows every day to new pasture and they eat the top of the grass 
which nutritionally has the most carbohydrates in it, which is what makes us fat, and it's also what makes cows fat. So we try and do that rotation, and it makes, I'll show you some of our steaks. Uh, they're as highly marbled as any grain-fed steak, and, but it is all about the management and the speed with which you move, and you be sure to give them that top bit of grass. If you look at other uh, traditional methods that people raise cows on, and in fact, over on that hillside, there's 20 cows in one probably 20 acre pasture and they never move and the grass is only this tall. Right. And that makes a tremendous difference underground as well as nutritionally. There's no, there's no resilience there for moisture absorbing, absorbing um, and it, it just doesn't regrow fast well, enough. Well, they probably and, also trample the ground pretty heavily. The, yeah, the ground is light, it's heavily they're trampled. They're not light animals. <laughs> and it's selected. The, the plants that they like are eaten down to the ground. The right. weeds grow. So it makes a tremendous difference using this kind of uh, uh, managed managed grazing. So I guess like you could maybe tell a lot by the marbling of the meat. So when, I mean, obviously, if... if anyone is a meat eater, they look for that type of marbling as well, you know, maybe a connoisseur. Well, meat. we've been trained to look for prime cuts are mm -hmm. highly intermuscularly marbled, and it, it has been a real, it's been a long time to get the techniques down for this kind of managed grazing to produce that kind of meat. Mm -hmm. You've got to have a very, very good pasture. And the other thing about our pastures is the diversity, and you can see a little of it right mm -hmm. here. When we first came out here, I wanted to know, you know, how diverse is this field? And we, we actually took a measured out a square meter, and we took a whatever. Like a transect, almost. We took a transect, we cut it all down, yeah. and we segregated it by plants. And we had up to some spots had 20 different varieties of plants. Right. And now this is year seven. We'll walk out into some of the other areas. The density of plants is so much higher because as the cows are walking, they've got their two hooves, and it, it pushes the soil apart a little bit, and it, is a, it exposes a little bit of bare soil to the sun, mm -hmm. and that is one of the things that it triggers seeds to grow, because there's a massive amount of latent seed bed. We haven't planted any of this. This has not been plowed in at least 50 years. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I was just on a call in regards to Kind of managing landscapes as it relates to kind of pollinators and insects and things along those lines. And it's really the savannas, it's really after kind of in that type of grazing where you get the most diversity for pollinators and yeah, insects. Yeah, absolutely. Which, you know, again, is, is interesting because you're managing the land in that way, maybe not intentionally for pollinators or insects, but if you said, I want to manage this for pollinators and insects, maybe it would be like raising animals in the way that you are raising them. Absolutely, that is so key. And you imagine, you know, you get that little bit of space, a little bit of poop, a little bit of urine, a little yeah. bit of rain, and some new seed is gonna sprout. And seeds have an incredible lifespan under the soil. Um, there's a gastropod episode that I was going to send you. I don't know oh, if my daughter sent it to no, you. No, she didn't. But they've, uh, they've put, there's a couple of universities that did this. They put jars two feet under the ground uh -huh. with a known number of different plants, uh, plant seeds. And then every 10 years, they'll go out and dig up a jar and see which seeds uh, will sprout. Yeah. And there's some of them are 50 years old that are still sprouting. So huh. it's very interesting yeah. how long seeds can last in the soil. Is, is this to notify where the chickens are? It's where the campsite is. <laughs> oh, okay, where the campsite. So you, you, turn, you turn right at the rooster. You turn first at that one down <laughs> yeah. there and then this one. And uh, <laughs> it's a hip campsite. And people come here from all over the country. How many camp? Oh, I guess you- We have two. Two campsites. Okay. And that's the unique thing. There's only two okay. on 200 acres. Yeah. You know, a conventional camping is you're here, someone else is next to you, yeah. somebody else's kids are next to you. So <laughs> it's a very isolated experience. Well, this is incredible. I mean, if you look at the landscape around, you're just like nestled in this valley of yeah. just like all these amazing hills. You could see kind of where the streams would flow and everything. This is so yeah. beautiful. Like your grandparents, I guess, picked a, a really beautiful space. Now, I'm just curious because I want to I want to go into this ecological stuff because I think it's really interesting. I think a lot of the viewers would find it interesting, but I just want to get a bit more of your history because you didn't you you stepped away and so did your, your brother stepped away as well. Tell, tell me about that story. We we left 
as soon as we could. You did not want to be. I, we any, were not going to be farmers. A lot of kids growing up on farms always said, "I, you know, you I'm, know we, find me the next ticket out of here." I, I, it's so funny. I, at that time, there wasn't a lot. My, my parents didn't know a whole lot about where to go to college, so I was in the library in high school, and there was a college catalog that was a weird format. It stuck out on the shelf. And it was Arizona State University. <laughs> now, that's where I'm going. <laughs> that, that's how it, the marketing at Arizona State University made a lot of sense when they just like, <laughs> they how wide are those format. library cells? So I, I left. I've, I have had a very checkered career. I've traveled all over the world. I was an electrical engineer. I became a program manager for a telecommunications equipment manufacturing company. And... Um, yeah, I, I've done a lot of different things. For the last 20 years, I worked for a company called Sienna. And during that time, I was in Kansas City. And we, we went to an agricultural conference in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, this was 20 years ago. And I, I had, it was just strictly recreational. I had no idea that, this, that it would plant the seed of what would, would have brought me back here. And there was a guy there speaking named Joel Salatin, and anybody who's yeah. listening to this who is into agriculture and alternative resilient agriculture knows about Joel Salatin. Right. And, and I stood there, out because I didn't want to pay the extra five bucks to actually go in and see him, <laughs> so I just stood outside the curtain and listened. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, that, started, that started this whole path to thinking about, well, how could I, how could I do that? And then later in March of 2010, I re remember this pretty clearly, I was having health and nutrition problems. I was overweight, I had high blood pressure, and I stumbled onto the Paleo Solution by Rob Wolf mm -hmm. and uh, decided, wow, I need to change my diet. And I eliminated all gluten and dairy and started becoming highly aware of how what you eat profoundly affects your health and well-being. And I, I'm still obsessed with that and follow a lot of people in that field. Um, so between Joel Salatin's sphere of influence and the paleo sphere and thinking about how can I be involved in this and then realizing, oh, my parents are here, they're aging, and we've got 200 acres we're going to inherit. It all sort of started to come together that maybe we can build something here with all these different overlapping interests. And we started to develop the plan for for Red House Rancher probably 10 years ago when yeah. we actually started laying it out and thinking about, you know, would we want to come back? And I and when you say we, who who's so I, I reached out to my brother and I at that time he's a heating and air conditioning uh, technician spending. So I spent a lot of computer screen time. Mm -hmm. He spent a lot of vehicle screen time <laughs> because he was spending most of his time driving to and from jobs right. and. We both realized it might be time to to do something different. And are you around the same age, or we're we're two years apart? Okay. Yeah. And then you both had this like coming together. And was he also experiencing this kind of like? I mean, I guess you guys were close, and you talked a lot, and you said, "Hey, I'm not feeling as well, and I'm on this paleo diet. It's really cool." I mean, I guess that's what happens, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like like all diets, everybody has their own unique takes and settles on different things, but he, he also realized that there was some advantage to eating a little differently and yeah. having a more physical life. So that, uh, that aspect of it too has been very helpful for both of us because, yeah. you know, we're still very physical. It's very manual yeah. and uh, it's helped maintain both of our, both of our, I think, health and longevity. Well, that's really interesting. And then, so in 2010, you started to plant the seeds of Red House Ranch. When did you really get back here and we, we came back seven around. years ago okay actually seven years ago um came back spent some money on infrastructure fencing and uh bought our egg mobiles built some egg mobiles can we go see the chickens really yeah quickly? let's take a look at the chickens <laughs> so um you had mentioned in the past that you might be winding down some of the business on the eggs or on the meat chicken or how, how does this work we are going to abandon the egg business. We've had up to 2,500 layers here. It's very labor intensive. Um, it's difficult to charge enough for that volume of eggs to right. actually pay ourselves, right? My whole idea has been to make this an enterprise where we can actually pay ourselves a, a, a living wage. Right. Unlike most farmers who are just happy to 
be able to turn the tractor on and yeah. pay their ba pay their basic bills, not necessarily make an income. Mm -hmm. So this is a very classic, you know, these are truly pastured, cage free. Uh, they're fed organic, but we're not certified organic. And this, this vehicle will move back and forth across the field. You can see it started here. Yep. And you've got these, they look like dead spots. Yeah. But but by fall, they will start growing, and next year the grass in there will be—it'll—it'll it'll be dark, dark green. Mm. And it'll be a foot taller than everything around it. Right. So it is an amazing system of pumping these the extra microbes from the chickens, the phosphorus, the nitrogen. It is—it's done a lot to a lot of our pastures. So we've had chickens on the field, different fields, over the last seven years, and you can see right where they've been because the grass just. Whoop, yeah. Pops up in bright green. <laughs> and then that, of course, is where we will graze the cattle on that. Yeah. And so you really move them just around this particular field right here. And you can see they're open grazing. Yeah. Do you, how do you, you, you just probably have to deal with the hawk once in a while, right? Or So we don't, we, we're very lucky. Usually this is electrified. This year we haven't electrified any of our fences okay. for the chickens because we don't have, we have lots of coyotes. They're all over the place. Foxes, everything, but we don't have many ground predators. Um, it's been mainly owls. Interesting. At night, they will walk right in, grab a chicken, rip its head and neck off and fly away. I mean, uh, do you have cameras at night? Cause that'd be crazy. To well, see. It would, we <laughs> haven't terrible, caught it on camera, but, like... but we can tell by the modus operandi, that's yeah. classic owl. Yeah. Um, we don't have, you know, there's eagles around here. Yeah. There's tons of hawks. There's a guy coming today to buy some chickens who's lost all of his chickens from hawks. And it's like, wow, we've been really lucky that we haven't had that problem. I think it maybe helps that you have some hip campers around. You know it what I mean? Just a, <laughs> this is smell of human nearby. Do these fields get grazed at all? Or are, they, are you just kind of maintaining them um, yourself? They have been grazed every year except okay. this year. Yeah, and you can see your goldenrods coming back up. You have your clovers, you have yeah, your queen clovers, Anne's lace, there's your Timothy. Lasagna. Yeah, butter and eggs, fleabane. You got quite a bit. Okay, so then you Oh, have, and our favorite. Oh, multi-flora rose. We talked about how oh, we were man. taking out all of this stuff, which we, you have uh, to. We have resorted to spraying it, I regretfully and shamefully say, but mm -hmm. There's so much of it, and this it's a permanent one-time solution. I mean, this was actually marketed oh, to it's probably marketed. your it was, grandparents' yes. era as a, as a living Plant, edge. Uh, we, if we went over on the other side of the hill where it was too steep to mow, you'll yeah. find these things that are literally 15 feet in diameter, this giant impenetrable ball of thorns. Yeah. And you can't walk on the hillside anymore because yeah. it is completely covered by them. It was, it was good intentions, I think, yeah. initially. So uh, if we walk like this way, we'll hit a little road. And sure. Can... So just out of uh, curiosity, you have, um, you know, your your beef and your pork. How do you or how have you kind of navigated managing, you know, these actually three animals because you have your your chickens, but I kind of feel like they're a little bit more easy to manage. You know, you have your pork and your beef and how are you kind of splitting your time in your fields with that? Well, what is so interesting that the pork and the beef have the least amount of labor. Is that right? Um, the, and, and the pork is the lowest by far. And, and you'll see that when we look at their setup. Um, then in terms of the labor for the cows, it, it's a half hour every day. You go out, you move the fence and you're done. Yeah. And that's the beauty of beef to me is you need a cow, you need grass, and you need salt and water, and then a little bit of management. And you Wait, get- is, is that once it's, once it's on your plate or before it's on your plate? <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's a good point, before it's on your plate. But that's all it takes to make the, one of the most nutrient dense foods that you can have, chickens, pork, they take ex external inputs, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to have, if you want to do it in an economically viable way, you've got to have soybeans, you've got to have corn, you've got to have feed for them because right. they will not grow to marketable size in a reasonable amount of time without those external inputs. Whereas beef, 
you're, you're looking at what they live on. Yeah. I mean, it is amazing. Um, the other thing that we do for our beef in terms of management is we, add, we have a mineral tub, right? You've got to have the salt, but we also put in their uh, seaweed. Oh, interesting. Ground seaweed, and that provides a whole suite of micronutrients, iodine being the yeah. first, and then selenium, and then all the other things that come with seaweed. And it's kind of like um, you know people use that for plant fertilizer as well. Absolutely, for those micronutrients. and you get those micronutrients. And what's so interesting is w usually when we first get the cows, we'll have the tub of seaweed there, and they'll just it'll just disappear. Yeah. Like they've been starving for something in there because animals have a unique ability to tell what they need and what foods will provide it. They will mm -hmm. selectively graze for the optimum nutrient input. And then we'll fill the tub back up and they'll start grazing and it'll just sit there. Yeah. And they won't, they won't eat any. And sometimes they'll get in a different section of pasture and all of a sudden it starts, they start eating it. Huh. And it, it, we, we feel it's a really important component not just for them, but for us, because that those nutrients are going to transfer right to us when we eat that beef. Yeah. And there's some very interesting research going on at the University of Utah, I believe, on not just micronutrients, but phytonutrients, secondary plant metabolites, as they actually move through the animal and then on to humans. Yeah. Uh, the guy's name is Dr. Van Leet. It's an amazing new field of research on you know, you are what you eat. Yeah, fascinating. And now let's also talk about, uh, from the political perspective, one of the things that I know a lot of farmers uh, discuss is kind of the co-opting of terms. So, you know, in many ways people understand who are in the environmental field, like how sustainability has been co-opted. What, what in the farm world, I mean, from grass-fed to U.S. raised to <laughs> regenerative, how are these words kind of being co-opted to a certain degree and what's your view on them yeah it's so there's a lot of aspects to that the first one that comes to mind is called cool country of origin labeling uh-huh um you see some meat this is particularly for meat and meat had a special carve out to the cool legislation when you buy uh you know a steak in the grocery store it says made in the usa uh -huh. Well, it was only packaged in the USA. It is from Argentina or any, anywhere else except the USA. So that, that is one of the grossest abuses of, a, I don't know what you call it, greenwashing, mislabeling, deception of the consumer, right? Uh, people are trying to change that, but it's the foreign countries threatened to sue us in the World Trade Court because it would, it would bias uh, consumers towards U.S. meat versus, versus imported meat. I see. So that's one thing. Um, regenerative is another one. Um, Has that been co-opted quite yet, or is it starting to... Regenerative? Yeah. Yeah, so Cargill, right, which is one of the largest meat packers and industrial agricultural entities in the country, uh, they are spending lots of money on regenerative and figuring out how to use that word on their products. Uh -huh. uh, the other one is organic. Organic has been taken over by, uh, we're not organic certified. It's not worth the time. It doesn't really have the value that it had 30 years ago when it first came out. Right. Um, it's been very diluted in, in my opinion. So I think it, it goes back to the, like knowing your farmer, if you can know one, you know what I mean? Like yeah, that's yeah. one of the benefits like of, of being here because that I see and I think that, it, you know, one of the things that people had always said is that you know the best way that you could like support your local community or you could support your food system is by supporting your farmers obviously most of us these days especially if you lived in the city and you lived in cities for a while it's hard to know your farmer because there's not a farmer around right right well and we're lucky now we have things like this where you can actually see it you can yeah. look at our youtube channel where i'm out there talking about the you know, I gave that seaweed spiel in one of my YouTubes. Yeah. Uh, so that is one way. But even that, um, there are a lot of giant corporations now that have very sophisticated websites. They have lots of pictures. A butcher box. I mean, yeah. you look at that and you think, oh, I'm getting real food. You really don't know what you're getting with right. any of those. Right. I was even looking at... Um you know, Whole Foods, and they had like these uh, stages or steps that you could go one through five or whatever. 
And uh, where five is like the premium meats that, you know, are locally sourced. And, but you go there and you don't have fives there. <laughs> yeah, it's really hard right. to get fives. Well, it is really hard and, because- and, they, and, they, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's packaged in like pasture raised or grass fed and this kind of stuff, which is actually meaningless to a certain degree now, unless you could actually come out and actually see it with your own yeah. eyes. Yeah, and you know, our whole, the whole industrial food system, the supply chain is set up, you've got to be big, you've got to be massive to get into Whole Foods. You've got to have thousands of cows that you're processing, and we are operating on a very different scale than that. What's so, your scale? Like, tell me a little bit So we've about... had up to 25 cows on here, okay. on, on our property. Um, we would like to develop a big enough customer base where we could get back to that level. We now ship all over the Northeast. We've got our shipping systems in place and we've got that all figured out. So you go um, on, like if you go online, what's your website? www.redhouseranch.net. And then where do you ship to? What's your delivery um, area? I'll have to give you the, the graphic for that, mm -hmm. but it's, it's essentially the Northeast, Pennsylvania, and then everything northeast of that. Right, so you can get one day shipping. Essentially, you if, it's one to two days when it arrives. We ship with dry ice, we ship in a completely recyclable box, no styrofoam. Um, we, yeah, and it's, it arrives frozen or ice cold when you yeah. get it. Yeah, well that's fantastic because I actually had worked in uh, local food and getting kind of like the last mile like farm to, uh, to people's homes. And that logistics is a lot to kind of think about. And it's interesting to see that you said, okay, we, we could, with the advent of modern day shipping, we could get it to this extended area. And there's a lot of people within that area, yeah, actually. Yeah, there's over 70 million people in that area. Yeah. And it's a matter of finding the ones that really want to know their farmer and to know their food yep. and connecting with those people. And we have a lot of loyal customers like that now. And it's, it's wonderful, they, they love shopping online. And we even have a store here, mm -hmm. which we'll take a look at where you can walk in and actually look at the products. Mm -hmm. and we have a point of sale terminal there. That's great. And I guess that's wonderful too for people who come and like maybe stay on your land. Yeah, exactly, the campus. Take a cooler back, yep. you know, of, of stuff. And I think um, there's other issues that, like with meat and like directly related to people's health and along those things. I mean, I know that, you know, sometimes there's a discussion of like putting what you put into your cows, not just the grass, but like a ton of antibiotics or whatever, you know, you often see antibiotic free or this or that. And I imagine it, it's important to actually keep your animals healthy. And, but you know, th that is something that people like consider also when they're putting into their body as well. Yeah, and that, that is our whole thing with all of our animals, antibiotic free. But I, I do have to say, there's a place for antibiotics. Like if you have a cow that's wounded and has an infection, mm -hmm. just like you or me, like I avoid antibiotics at all costs, yeah. but I had bronchitis a, two months ago and I still have a little of it resonating in me. And yeah. I got antibiotics, rightly or wrongly. Sonder, and, Sonder got bit by a tick. He had to get doxycycline as much as yeah, he didn't want to take yeah. it. But you know? generally, I mean, in the last couple of years, we haven't used any. Yeah. We've had a pig a few years ago that needed needed a shot of mm -hmm. something. But normally, and that's part of the advantage of this method of agriculture. The animals are not confined. They eat an incredible diversity of plants. So mm -hmm. they get all those different plant metabolites to maintain their immune system. They're in the sun, especially with the hogs. Hogs raised indoors in a confined building. It's, it's just mind boggling to me that that's the standard, but that is the standard and they have to get all their, all their nutrition from a fixed feed. And that certainly doesn't include the kind of plants that you'll see that the, that the pigs eat. So, I mean, this is kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy analog, but it's, it's almost like the same where you're just like, you know, we're crowded in this environment in the city. <laughs> we have this fixed yeah. feed down the road, you could only go to the McDonald's. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it is exactly analogous to that. <laughs> and you're not exercising, yeah. you're sitting on the couch, you're eating lots of Cheetos. Yeah. <laughs> and what happens to you? You get fat, you get, you know, the whole, and it's a global epidemic. And, yeah. and you'll see these pigs out here running around and the sun is shining on their skin, their bodies are making natural vitamin D, not mm -hmm. vitamin D from a feed mix. Right. Um, and yeah, yeah. This is great. Look at this like little forestry setting. 
It's very a very unusual stand of trees. We call it the pine woods. We used to play up here when we were kids. And then I found out that my dad and his sister used to play up there when they were kids. <laughs> Do you have um, plans for the farm? Like, have you thought about like kind of the future of the farm? And you know, was your dad thinking about the future of the farm as he was starting to get older? Like, he he probably wasn't expecting you and your brother to come back. And Absolutely, they they were abs completely flabbergasted when I came back. I actually. You know, PowerPoints were my part of my world and yeah. spreadsheets. And I came back and I said, <laughs> I, them down I, said I want to show you PowerPoint. They looked at me like, whoa, what? <laughs> what is this? And, they probably uh, fell asleep at the dinner table. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it, was, it was not death by PowerPoint. <laughs> um, but no, they, they had no idea what they were going to do with it. They had no idea that we, this, this would happen. Yeah. And we've, you know, uh, succession planning is a big thing. I mean, if it is to be a successful business, it has to transfer to somebody. Otherwise, it will just vaporize. Yeah. And, you know, we're looking at all of our grandkids, trying to figure out who might, who is interested, and yeah. we don't know yet. Yeah. You never know how people, like, just how Like us. I mean, yeah, who would have thought we yeah. came back? Yeah. I mean, do you, do you <clears throat> ever look back and you're like, oh, my life could have been so different? Or you, 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 you have no regrets, like, this is where you wanted to be. Oh yeah, no, I, 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 don't, I don't regret this at all. Yeah. I mean, it, it's had many benefits, you know, a, a, just being here, helping my parents, they, they, it would have been very difficult for them to stay here and maintain the property without yeah. us around. So now this, so let's talk about what we're seeing here a little mm -hmm. bit. This is an electrified fence, it's called polywire. Okay. This is the same technology that we use to manage our cows with. And this is what is confining the pigs into this area. Um, it's it's quite amazing. It's really high voltage. It's very <laughs> another one over there. <laughs> it's a very very short pulse. It's on the order of microseconds. Okay. Um, so it, it, will, it, it will hurt. It will make you see a bright light. But um, <laughs> it, I almost walked into that. You almost backwards. walked into that backwards. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't see. And there's another pointed. one right there. Yeah. So. <laughs> so we sometimes we have our hogs in the forest, which is called silvopasture. Right, so they're eating acorns and whatever they can uh, find. Yeah, whatever yeah. they can find, and um, we've we we wanted to explore this method of purely pasture, and this field has had some cover crops planted on it. We had our chickens here last year, so there okay. was a massive amount of nitrogen and phosphorus here. So we, in the spring, we di we disked and we put down some cover crop and we'll go out and look at that. Um, it didn't work out quite the way I wanted to, but we're going to next year, we'll, we're going to disk this whole field and plant it in a hog specific uh, seed set with things like pumpkins, sunflower, uh, sorghum sedan grass, um, collards, things that beans, yeah. things that hogs will specifically eat and thrive on and get a lot mm -hmm. of calories from. Mm -hmm. And that's our plan for this next year. You know, it looks bombed out. It's looked like, oh man, what kind of farmers are these people? They don't know how to <laughs> keep their fields flat. We, we really don't care if our fields are flat. A lot of farmers are obsessed with making them look like a pool table, but right. <laughs> it's for the animals and they don't care yeah. really. And the, we had the water here. We just moved this yesterday. We moved them all down a little bit. Um, you know, next year this this will be completely green. The grass will be a lot taller. There's mm -hmm. a lot of manure that's been spread out here, and you can tell it doesn't smell. Yeah, that's the no, beauty of all. this, right? We yeah. we could easily scale this to have over a hundred pigs on this property with multiple multiple different cohorts rotating around through the pastures and the woods. Yeah, well, it's it's very interesting because you mentioned the flat fields, and what's fascinating about it is that you know you have quite a bit of topography here. I mean, your your topography is hilly and it's oh. naturally, you're kind of leaning into the natural topography of the yeah. land. So that's our hog feeder and that's where we put our, we have a very interesting and unique feed mix that we should talk about. So normally it's corn and beans is the, are the primary components. Okay. Not quite 50-50. And then there's a mineral mix of a whole bunch of other micronutrients. We, in my obsession with health and nutrition, as well as what we want to have for our end product, which is charcuterie, mm -hmm. we've learned that 
it's better to have less omega-6 fatty acids in the end product. And where does that all come from? Well, it comes from corn. Corn, yeah. Corn is the sort is in the feed mix, not for the fatty acids, but for the carbohydrates, right? That's yeah. what helps the pigs put on put on fat. And so is it, you want that balance also in your body of like the omega-3 and omega-6? Yes, is that I'll, how? I'll, I'll get to that. Okay. So, so we don't use corn okay. in our hog feed. We use wheat, barley, uh, there may be another grain, but there's no corn. Mm -hmm. So they don't get that extra load of omega-6. So that you do get closer mm -hmm. in our bodies, uh, the ideal ratio is like two to one or one, ideally mm -hmm. one to one of omega-6 to omega-3. And it makes for a, for a denser fat. And mm -hmm. that may go against everything everybody believes. Oh, it's gonna clog my arteries, mm -hmm. I'm gonna die. That's simply not true. Yeah. Um, but it, if you're making charcuterie, like like the pepperoni we're going to look at, yeah. that's what you want is a harder fat. So, you know, we're just starting up that operation to explore those kind of products. And now that we've got this feed mixed down, they thrive on it. We've got a, 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 a feed mill that makes it for us. Uh, it's also the other important element to all of our feed is that it's non-GMO certified. Hmm. And it's not organic, but... Having it non-GMO certified means that they're not using Roundup That's on right. their fields yeah. uh, or any, anything else usually either. It's usually a different kind of farmer that cares about not using GMO modified products. Right. And all of our food is non-GMO verified. And then uh, obviously, like you said, you know, the organic label has kind of lost. It's a, a lot of rigmarole. It, it's... Um, it's it's expensive for very little value in return so exactly yeah. exactly that's and that's why we don't go and get organic yeah. to get the non-gmo because we can get the non-gmo just from the non-gmo verified program exactly so <clears throat> over here mm -hmm. this mud pile uh this is this is where we had a cover crop planted. Oh yeah, I see. And in the cover crop. It's like turnips or? Or turnips. Yeah. And beets. And we thought, oh, the pigs will eat it. But I mean, we just had this left over. This is a typical cover crop that we would use for grazing cattle. There was a lot of sorghum sedan grass. Mm -hmm. We planted it too early and all the grasses got frozen during that brutal frost yeah, that we had. Yeah, that May, that but May frost. whatever else was in here really attracted them to this area and they yeah. have turned it up and you can see this is this is a very you know they they hogs want to root yeah you, we'll look at this area over here but they turn all this grass over this they do this with their nose <laughs> and they eat the roots and shoots that are under the ground yeah and that gets into this you know what are the micronutrients in there? What are the macronutrients in there that they're absorbing that we subsequently will be absorbing? Right, and they're they're getting some of that dirt and everything. And they're getting the dirt. There. Yeah. They're getting the yeah. microbiome, and then they're pooping and peeing and doing yeah. and doing the same thing, giving that back. Which is why you know I think like as as kids, you said you you know you and your brother are up there playing. You're you know getting your hands dirty. You're probably like. Licking your sure. fingers, you you get you get dirt and 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 grime in there too. So you kind of get somebody your own said I don't know who, but it, you got to eat a pound of dirt before you die to stay healthy. <laughs> but this, I mean, it looks like this has almost been mechanically done. Yeah. This is from ten pigs, and we just let's see where are we here? We just opened this up two days ago. Right. They they do this really quickly. You know, for some people, they would say this is uh, pretty intense, but the land kind of regenerates and heals itself really quickly. Yeah. I'm really worried that I don't see them. <laughs> you have no... <laughs> you're like, uh oh <laughs> They busted through the electrical fence. Well, we actually left it off for a while. Uh, <laughs> oh, my gosh. See them? I think they're... Uh, See them? They're sleeping. Yeah. It's too early. Hogs are the last animals to get up on a farm. <laughs> yeah, sneak up on them there and you'll see them all laying together like hot dogs. Oh my God. This is why they call them pigs in the blanket. Oh my goodness. That's so adorable. Oh, what? Uh, did somebody wake me up? Are they pettable? Sort of. <laughs> they will jump up and bolt as we get close to them. Okay. Look at that. Oh, oh man, I want to get a picture of that. That's adorable. <laughs> I feel like I want to put a little blanket over them. Well, isn't that funny? They have that nice shelter that they could be yeah. in. 
And they sleep, sleep out here in the night, right? <laughs> it's called hip camp. <laughs> hip camp for pigs, yeah. Man, look at them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was like, that's a, enough. Where's my coffee? <laughs> he was like in, a, in, a, in the middle of a dream and I woke him up. <laughs> it's still too early. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's hilarious. So that's our 10 pigs all accounted for. Whew, really made me worry there. I was worried to call my brother and ask him what if he knew what happened. But, oh. you know, they're right next to the poly wire. Yeah. They get trained to that when they're little. We get them and they're about this big. Mm -hmm. And we put them in a, in a poly mesh fence like you saw with the chickens. And then we have a little, we have that poly wire on the ground so yeah. that they get used to it. And once they're trained to it, um, if you were to take that down, they'd be very hesitant to cross the space where the wire was. Interesting, yeah, okay. They get very, very habituated to it. And here's some, you see some uh, fresh fertilizer. Oh, right? uh, yes, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> So that's, that's our pork operation. We envisioned scaling this um, with our perimeter fence, which is just down there, which that's where we tap off the power for the, for the poly wire. We can run these kind of paddocks anywhere on the 200 mm -hmm. acres. And with these kind of portable sun shelters, you could have 25 or 30 pigs in the middle of a pasture in July and they would be perfectly fine in the, yeah. In the heat. Yeah. I'm so amazed that they just, that they don't even get up. It's good sleep. We moved them, was, it was yesterday. This is all, all digging all that they've done in yeah. the last, like say 48 hours. Well, they've been working hard. That's where they're taking yeah. a nap. And they, you know, they turn this over and yeah. you'll see them chewing on that stuff. Yeah. And that is a whole lot different than a hog that's been raised in a CAFO and fed a fixed mixture of, of corn grain. beans yeah. and a bunch of other, other stuff. Yep. Um, the diversity of that, and then it would be nice to get them running around because when you see, that's the other big part of it, it changes the composition of the muscle when you can actually be out there sprinting. Like the analogy you talked yeah. about, right? When you sit on a couch, your, your musculature is not the same as if you're out, you know, running a few miles Damn every day. Straight. And these that's things that. run like crazy. Yeah. You, you, and, and it's scary. They're yeah. so powerful. And that's, their hams are, you know, massive because well, they think, actually get to work them out. I think people who live in areas where pigs have become wild... You know, because yes. they return to the wild like very quickly, and they they become quite disastrous. Because you could imagine, like yeah, this, this in your front yard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. it's pretty crazy. This was an egg mobile. As we're winding down, we have two of these, and there used to be nest boxes on the side, mm -hmm. but they make an ideal hog shelter, and it's movable. That goes along with our concept of constantly moving our animals, and we've pulled it several times here and you know is it on like wheels or how does it move it's, it's on, on a, skids oh, okay it's on, on skid, okay. little skis there and we hook the tractor up to this and just tug it forward how do you how do you work in the winter like when things are under cover of snow yes yeah, so hogs are incredibly resilient we we are getting new hogs tomorrow and we will they will not be processed until the end of january so we have a spot on the other side of the property where we have underground water that comes up, because that's the key thing. You've got to be able to get them water. Okay. We've got several different shelters. If a hog can be dry and out of the wind, they can withstand, like the wild hogs, mm -hmm. right? They can withstand the most brutal weather. Uh, and we've done this twice before. So that's what we do with our hogs. We don't have, we don't overwinter cows because we're old guys and we don't want to work that hard. <laughs> so we buy our cows in the spring and we finish them, you know, as late as December. So okay. we don't have that burden of having to feed them and water them over the winter. Um, so it's basically for you, it's a seasonal, it's seasonal, uh, I wouldn't well, say crop, it, but like, it, yeah. It, yeah, it is seasonal, yeah, yeah. definitely. By, yeah. by the end of January, we're, we're pretty much taking it easy. And in chapter two of Red House Ranch now, when we're starting to do this charcuterie mm -hmm. stuff, That'll be the time when we'll go to the commercial kitchen, you know, once or twice a week. Start a new batch of pepperoni or, or salumi or whatever it is we're making. Now, you mentioned going to a commercial kitchen, but you also mentioned to me that you're building a commercial kitchen yes, as well. Yes, so I, we to hope to have it house. built by finished. Well, it is the structure is physically there. The sinks are there, the stove, the gas. We're just doing the uh, water system now. I ordered the UV 
purification system two weeks ago. So we'll have a commercial kitchen to work in here very shortly. And literally, it's right, see that cell tower? Yep. It's 200 yards to the right of that. Okay, so do you own all? No, the that's our neighbors, the okay. Smith brothers, who do okay. maple syrup. Oh, nice. Uh, they, may, they, they use some of our trees to make maple syrup. That's so we're, great. we're collaborating on the kitchen with them. That's fantastic. It's really nice to be able to have, like, this network of folks that are still yeah. here that are working on things. I'd imagine even like a little maple syrup on some pork would be. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, we we talk about making uh, maple flavored yeah. breakfast sausage. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. I yeah. mean, those are all the kind of options that become available when you yeah. have something like that together, and people to collaborate with. Absolutely, and you were mentioning that some of your uh, pepperoni or uh, pepperon goes actually to. Uh, another mutual friend that we have, Terry, yes. from Stone Bend Farm. Terry at Farm, Stone Bend. Highlighted he, well. he is my inspiration for that. Yeah, uh, a, fantastic. he's a very inspirational person, and he told me a product that he needed, and I thought, well, that's a great challenge because yeah. we were looking for something like that to to work on. So he's using that to source for his pizzas. Well, then. we we've only had a few beta batches, yeah. test batches, but once we scale up, uh, he should be he as well as. You know, there's a whole massive set of restaurants along the wine trail that yeah. have a charcuterie plate. Yes, absolutely. And what's on it? Yeah. Nothing from around here. That is so that's, crazy. So that is, that is a market that we're looking to try yeah. and develop some products. So one thing I want to talk about here, this pipe. Mm -hmm. Looks like pipe, plain old pipe, but it's... Look like at irrigation. It's a special pipe that we use. It comes in 500 foot lengths and we can move it wherever we want. Like it wasn't here earlier in the year, but we brought the hogs out and we reconfigured it. We've got about two and a half miles of it. Yeah. And we can set it up wherever we want. If we want to graze cattle over there, we'll just sling a hunk of this pipe around so it will serve where we're going to be for a while. And then in the winter, we pick it up and we move it back to us. We're going to store it here in the pine trees. And that's a whole part of this kind of the infrastructure for this kind of agriculture can be very low cost, mm -hmm. right? because it's not buried, it's not permanent, and it gets back to that seasonal part that you were talking about, right? Yeah. That's one of the advantages of not having to overwinter a whole lot of cows. And how, how are you, like, especially when you're talking about, like, the charcuterie and everything, how, how are you going out and, like, talking to these restaurants? Like, what is your strategy to go out and, like, build a customer base? I think, like anything, you show up with a business card, an elevator pitch, and a sample. Yeah. A free sample. And Terry also, uh, I think he's going to be one of our, uh, what do you call it? Like uh, a rep? A rep, not a rep, but uh, somebody who can say, yeah, this stuff is good. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, it's marketing. Yeah. I'm not the greatest at it. My sister is much more in that field, so. Who we met earlier today. We met earlier, yeah. but I mean, it's, it's, all about, it's all about meeting the people. Everybody wants this kind of food. That's yeah. the thing. If you show up with something that is truly high quality and delicious, um, a lot of these places will, will naturally go for it. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to show you this. So this, this like a is, fire hose. <laughs> is very configurable. If the power pressure wasn't on, I'd take it off, but you mm -hmm. can just unscrew this in mm -hmm. 10 seconds and all of a sudden the hose is free or you mm -hmm. can put something else on. It's much different than the conventional type of fittings that farmers historically use. They are more expensive, but um, the, the ease of changing and being flexible is, we love it. Yeah, that's fantastic. And it's just a, is, is it considered more of an irrigation hose or what, no, what it, kind of hose, like what um, type of? PVC pipe is that? It's called outside diameter, outside diameter controlled pipe. It could be for irrigation. Some people bury okay. it. It has all kinds of applications. We want to we just head right down this road and not bother our hip campers. So when did you start the hip camp? I think four years ago. Okay. So kind of halfway through your farming day. Yeah, well, like a lot of things, you know, I get we get ideas from other people. Yeah. My daughter, Maya, who you met the other day, yeah. She said, Dad, have you ever heard of hip camp? Of course not. You need to start one. <laughs> and I looked at it and thought, wow, this, this would be a good thing because yeah. it would do that ag education piece as well as a little bit of extra revenue. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, you have this piece of land and then you're just looking at it and you're like, how do I diversify as much as possible? And like sometimes when you might have 
those places where he, you know you might have lost <coughs> a, a couple customers or whatever, you can make it up in another mm -hmm. in another uh, business. Or even when you want to take the time to do research and development, which quite tank, frankly takes resources and time, then it allows you to you know do that a little bit more by diversifying your business. So yeah, brilliant idea yep, on her yep, part. It works great. This is just so gorgeous. This outlook of this landscape, it's very beautiful. And I think some people who probably farm are like, wow, this is too many rolling hills. So in the 40s, <laughs> the US government went around and characterized all the farmland. Yeah. And they called this, I, I don't forget, remember the exact term, but it was something like pitifully pathetic, useless <laughs> farmland. And there are all these pictures of these dirt farmers that were up here. At, literally, there are pictures of farms on Rumsey Hill Road, yeah. something like unacceptable farmland. And in terms of corn and beans and row crops, it really is. It's rocky, but for grass, this is the best. Yeah. I mean, when we have our grass growing, it is absolutely amazing. The amount of beef and protein that you can get off a of land like this, when you look at it that way, a very yeah. different way than saying, oh, I got to plow it and plant something, but making it a pasture, a perennial pasture, turns it into a whole different proposition. Yeah, I think that's so wonderful that you say that because if you go over towards like Trumansburg, for instance, yes. it's flat land, you know, you could do corn for days there, yes. you know, and, it, and it's perfect for that. Everything's in a grid and yep. you just really lean into what the landscape is calling for, yeah. especially if you're going to like produce a certain uh, type of crop with it. You know, why force it into this like square peg and say, okay, I'm gonna put like a ton of corn right, and soy right. on here. And, and that's what everybody at, at the time in the early, I don't know, 50s, you know, they all had, they're all driven by po agricultural policy yeah. to, to do that. Which they're, is they're, often, they're, they were funded by wrong. banks to do that. <laughs> and and to, come, to do something different is really painful and difficult because yeah, yeah. everybody tells you you're crazy. And, you know, as Joel, Joel Salatin likes to say, when somebody tells you you're crazy and you're doing the wrong thing, keep doing it. And <laughs> I'm not sure that's always right, but in some cases, I think he, he might have a point. I think the, the challenge is, though, you know, in many ways, you want sometimes you want a little bit of that support from the government. Like, you know, I think people are in here. intentioned to go a certain way because it's easier money. They have subsidies, that type of thing. Yeah. Go ahead, you could, you could go Sorry, take doggy, poopies. sorry. You could take your poopies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so this is a lot of pickerel weed right here. Yes, and I'm not sure it's part of the video, but I wanted to talk about, uh, I don't about think, this whole thing. I don't think you would see this if it was like, a, you know, one of those CAFOs where you have all the... <laughs> <laughs> this is not a sewage uh, lagoon. Not no, a, like a big no, sewage, yeah. No, um, so many years ago, probably 30 years ago, um, I was living overseas and I wanted to build a pond and I had my uncle build this for me. It's 18 feet deep. Wow. And deep. all of these plants, I, I planted like 20 of those. Like yeah, pickerel weed. 30 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Um, there's, there's snails in here. If we went to the other side, I put 20 snails. There's probably 50,000 in here now. You could get escargot, charcuterie You could. And these are definitely escargot snails. Yeah. Um, those water lilies I planted, right? Yeah. I, I had the idea of creating this ecosystem, and, and I did. And these lotuses, we just planted this year, they're in a tub right now, yeah. and I want them to invade this pond, <laughs> because I want to see lotus all around. Yeah. And I think we, are finally, we finally have a tuber that's growing well enough that we'll be able to do that. Um, I'm surprised your water lilies haven't taken over. Well, they so when I had the pond designed, there was a specific intent. I didn't want to have a lot of growth on, on all the edges. So that wall over there slopes down very steeply, and very fast. I right? see, okay. It gets deep right away. I intentionally made a shelf here that is four feet deep. I see. So and then it drops the off. Yeah. So those water lilies are competing with these guys and mm -hmm. they, they can't quite in yeah. that shallow water. But my, my idea was to create habitat for fish in here. And, and this definitely is fish spawning habitat. And, and it's a camping, you know, we grew up here swimming. Every summer, all the cousins would come here and hang yeah. out. 
And now we have hip campers. So I don't know where they're from, but they all, everybody comes down here and swims and enjoys the pond. Yeah, fantastic. What are some of the things that uh, you think are some of the most challenging aspects of the business, especially for somebody who's considering getting into this? What kind of words of advice would you have? I mean, obviously some people are still looking for land. You were fortunate enough to have this already in your family. But beyond that, what, what kind of words of advice would you give folks? It all depends on what you want to try and do, right? My, my goal was to create an enterprise that, that could make, pay us a, a, a living wage. If you just want to do this on a hobby level, that, that's a whole different question. But if you really want to do it from a business point of view, you've got to start out doing some spreadsheet calculations. You know, how many cows do I need to have? At what percentage of income am I going to retain from those cows? What are going to be my processing costs? Well, processing is a huge issue. We have to schedule our processing 18 months in advance. Wow. Okay. So, the, and this is somebody who will come and process your beef or your we, pork. We send it to them, USDA processors. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would say anybody who wants to do this. Are they local? Are there local processors? You'd probably have to find what processors are in your area. Some people have to travel, That's right? all part of the homework, yeah. right? Yeah, you have to figure out where that's all going to work. Where's your feed going to come from? The most important thing, I think, is going to school. I have spent a lot of time and money going to conferences, the grass-fed exchange. There's a whole bunch of them. There's soil conferences, and you have to go out and meet people, see what they're doing, visit farms, visit other people, look at other, follow a dozen websites of people that you want to be like, buy from them, see how they do order fulfillment. If you're really gonna do it at a business level, you have to be very tech savvy. You mm -hmm. have to understand web marketing. You have to use, you know, how many views per day am I getting? How much? Am I getting, you know, well, what's my cost per click? I mean, yeah. all these things what's my, that- What's my retention? What's my retention? <laughs> yeah. You know, what, how, what customers are buying again? What am I yeah. gonna do to make them come back? Yeah. It's an extremely complex thing. And, you know, one of the things when I give, I've given a couple lectures to conferences about this. One of the things I say is, before you start your tractor engine, you better have your marketing engine running well in advance. Yeah, it's really good advice. You you will not succeed. You'll go to farmers markets. You'll make a couple hundred bucks. You'll spend 12 hours to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's unless you unless you're doing that for fun, it's not worth it. Yeah. So you really have to understand. You know, how do I want to live? How do I want to spend? my precious hours that I have here on earth, right? Do I mm -hmm. want to be groveling and not make a penny? I meet a lot of cool people, mm -hmm. but it, you, it's very easy to get enchanted with the Joel Salatin view of the world and, and want to be part of that. And a lot of people get into it and I think maybe really lose their shirts in the long run. Mm. I think it's great advice. And I think, you, like you said, you, came, you and your brother both came from this uh, more, sounds like more engineering kind of background. So that way maybe that meticulous well, way of that, thinking as that's well. a really good point it, it really it takes a team right you one person isn't going to do it a husband and wife isn't going to do it either mm -hmm. um you know i do a lot of the financial piece i do all the order fulfillment shipping that kind of stuff my sister is excellent with all of the marketing, Instagram. I mean, you have to be out there in yeah. front if you want people to find you. It's so funny because your your parents probably like had the kids thinking that they would grow up working on the farm to a certain degree and then that started to that dream started to slip away and then here you say like my sister's doing this, my brother does this. <laughs> well, <laughs> and my mom <laughs> cooks plan, for us. Their my, plan was like, oh, my mom is <laughs> my mom is definitely part of the team. I mean, she patches our pants. She has lunch ready for us. She packs eggs with us. I mean, she She's like, man, she I tried to kick some, you out of the house and here you are. She tells us when something pants. doesn't taste good and like there's something wrong with this sausage. <laughs> okay, we'll look at it, you know. That's but, great. Uh, whether, whether it is a family team or you're prepared to buy a team, mm -hmm. right? There's nothing wrong with hiring an accountant, hiring a internet marketing expert to help you get your presence out there because you have to realize that if you try and do it all, you're going to be disappointed with yourself because you will never have enough done. And at some point, you've got to be able to, to breathe and live. And 
yeah, you, you, you got to face that reality. Of- we may have intimated it um, already in, in the, our discussion, but what has been the result of having a farm here? Because we are in like this little interesting area in the Finger Lakes where there are quite a lot of other farms that you could interact and partner with. You had mentioned, you know, your, the, the Smiths across the way who do maple uh, collecting as well. And then you provide some of the sugar maples on your land. We talked about Terry with like, you know, with his Stone Bend farm and the pizzas and he's using your pepperome. What's the, what's the experience has been for you here with all that interaction? Well, I, I really like it. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a, sort of an introvert, but I do like getting out and meeting all these people. I mean, to me, when we have a customer show up for the first time, you know, I always ask, well, how did you find us? Mm -hmm. And because I'm such a health and nutrition nerd, I'll invariably slip out a little question like that. Well, what's your favorite podcast? (laughs) Oh, I listen to Peter T. Oh, I do too. And, um, you know, that kind of interaction is really good. We had one customer who showed up the other day. My sister took care of her. Um, you know, she says, well, of all the people that are out there, why did you pick us? She said, well, because you have a good website yeah. and I can order and yeah. I can just come and get it. Yeah. There's many other people out there. Um, yeah, it's something that we've toyed with trying to help other people like be a food aggregator. Mm-hmm. But that hasn't really panned out for us, mm-hmm. finding other products to sell. And that is one of our downfalls. That's one of our shortcomings. When you look at some of our competitors like White Oak Pastures or Seven Sons, yeah. they have massive amounts of product right. because, because they have a hundred employees yeah. and they have a procurement manager and they White have Oak a website Pastures, developer. The one down in, uh, towards Atlanta. Atlanta, right? yeah, yeah, Georgia, yeah. yeah. Bluffton, Georgia. Yeah. Um, and those are my inspirations. So when did you paint the house red? Oh, <laughs> it was red when we were born. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was repainted a couple of years ago. But. <laughs> That's it's funny, it's funny, ranch. when we started, when we were starting this, I didn't know what we were going to call it. Yeah. So I sent a note to all my kids, and we, you know, hey, we're going to start this business, what should we call it? And within 20 seconds, my son replied, Red House Ranch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it really stuck. Yeah. That's great. So any, could people just come at any point and see, do they have to make an appointment? Like, how, it's when open is it? Saturdays. Okay. It is Saturday, right? Right. So, <laughs> it's opened. Then people order and just, we'll have it all ready and they come and pick up. Great. That's, so that's my that's nephew. That's nice that you have like a online store on your website, which is very easy to use and very intuitive and really good photography of like the products that you would get that are representative of the products that you would get. And then here locally, people could come and pick it up. Right. This is our display freezer. Oh, nice. Oh yeah, look at chicken wings. We got burgers, T-bone steak, pork lent, pet tenderloin, breakfast sausage, rib steak, New York strip steak. Oh, okay, you got the full on cut. Yeah, we got a pretty good selection. Yeah, and, jo- and dog treats too. Yeah, yep. Some dried pig ears, some big bones. Yeah. And then we have our storage freezer, our walk-in sub-zero freezer. Oh wow, okay. So we keep all of the bulk products. Great. We, we're friends with um, uh, Justin Peterson. He was the chef at uh, Hazelnut in Trumansburg. Oh, nice. And I know he's a... He, we've been he, meaning he, to eat there. I don't think we've ever He is there. a charcuterie expert. He, hmm. he, he doesn't run Hazelnut any longer. But, um, you know, I went to him and I said, hey, you know, I want to make... Here's all the other pepperonis. I want to mm-hmm. make something that's above and beyond. Mm-hmm. So he researched ancient pepperoni recipes and came up with a very unique set of ingredients as well as the process which is secret (laughs) and um, this is our third test batch that we that we made and uh, terry has tried some we've had a lot of people try it and they've all exclaimed how good it is i gave i gave a a whole one pound stick to my uncle and um thank you you know he called me back about 12 hours later you got any more of that i Mm -hmm. ate it all Mm -hmm. um it's it is this one is a little cold, but I mean, because it just came out of the freezer, but Ooh, wow, it has a, a lingering flavor. You can taste more fennel than you would in a typical. Well, usually if you have like, you're getting a slice of pizza and if you have that 
cheap piece of pepperoni, pepperoni on it. It's like, it's like, like spiced, but like overly spiced and just one flavor of spice. Yeah, yeah. this you know what is, I mean? you can, this you is can much made more nuanced. This and it's yeah. really good. And it's like, um, the texture is, is also very good. Yeah. Because and and the other thing about this is, this is a classic fermented sausage, right? You add a little bit of dextrose to it and a starter culture, and it creates lactic acid to mm -hmm. lower the pH so the meat doesn't, so the meat is safe. Mm -hmm. And then it literally hangs and dries in a drying chamber for up to six weeks mm -hmm. uh, to lose, to lose, it loses up to 40% of its moisture. Hmm. So there's more pork in there than, in, than, uh, per square inch than if you're eating a pork yeah. chop, right? and because it's marbled, like sometimes when you eat pe like a typical pepperoni and people will know anybody who has had a pet, pe like a one slice pepperoni pizza or whatever, you're kind of tearing into this. This kind of like falls apart in your mouth. Yeah, Th this is something- Because you, of the marbling. Yeah, this is something you, would, you wouldn't mind eating on a charcuterie board. Yeah. Those I would not, I mean, yeah. that's, so. So that's the end product out of all of that chattering about mm -hmm. plants and plant metabolites going through the animals and the exercise, mm -hmm. that produces the best ingredient mm. besides our spice mix. Our spices are all organic, yeah. they're all very clean. Nothing in there, nothing else in there besides spices and salt. That's great. And bacteria, right? I mean, to have salami, true salami, is, yeah. is created with lactobacillus bacteria. So you said this is kind of your third iteration on this. Do you think this is going to be your third and final? And when could people start getting your uh, pepperoni? We have batch four is, is curing right now. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to cure? It takes, the total process takes, I would say, seven weeks total. Okay. Start to finish. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that we're cranking this out in January. Great. Like you said, the seasonality of yeah. our business, we'll have more time to do development. And it all has to be certified. You have, you have to have the recipe certified by a mm -hmm. safety group that says, yes, your process will produce something that is safe. People yeah. aren't gonna get sick from eating it, which is really important, right? Yeah. We wanna comply with all the rules and regulations of how you make food that we're gonna sell to the public. So we have to go through that process. And um, hopefully in January we'll be, I plan to make 20 pound batches once a week as we get our systems running. We have automated chambers for the curing and for the drying chambers. We have to get all that automation down and make sure our record keeping systems are in place. And um, yeah, that's the plan. A lot of logistics. Well, thank you so much for taking us through this. I think this is gonna be really enlightening for folks who had been thinking about doing this or maybe interesting and in kind of transitioning into something that was maybe a, a little more tr you know traditional into something that's a bit more like you know this idea of regenerative and at least people may know a little bit more of what they're going to get into as well. Yeah. No matter what your personal dietary preferences, most of us can agree that supporting one's local farmers who contribute directly to the local food system is a sensible if not honorable act. It not only keeps money within the community, but also builds a level of resiliency in the region as a whole. Food is fresher and traceable. People have more of a trust and connection with where their food comes from. And having many local farmers throughout one's area builds a more healthful and accessible food system as a whole, which is especially apparent during times of need. And many local farmers, like our friends over at Red House Ranch, will prioritize farming methods that are not only ecologically sound, but also regenerative to the land. We encourage you to seek out local farmers in your area to support, and if you're living in the region or even visiting the Finger Lakes, be sure to check out Red House Ranch. 10% of our Google AdSense revenue is reinvested back into community projects here in the Finger Lakes, so be sure to like, subscribe, hit the notifications button, and even tip. Your support makes a difference. We'll see you in the next episode.